There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rash's World. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Richard Gallagher, and it's going to be a very um, fascinating topic. I am slightly nervous about it, too, and you will see uh, here why as well. But uh, Dr. Gallagher, could you please uh, briefly introduce yourself in any way you see fit before we start talking about your book? Well, I'm, I'm Dr. Richard Gallagher. Um, I'm a uh, American board certified psychiatrist. I'm a very busy clinical psychiatrist to this day. I did my training at, at Yale, and then I've been an academic psychiatrist ever since. I'm a full professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College. I also teach at um, Columbia University. And so uh, I'm very experienced. I happen to have a long time ago been asked by an American exorcist uh, to join as a scientific advisor, the International Association of Exorcists, which is a Catholic organization. So uh, every couple of years I go to uh, a place north of Rome and I'm now the longest standing American member of that organization. In fact, I'm, a, I'm gonna address the assembly this coming September. Oh, so, uh, you know, over the years I've gotten a tremendous amount of experience uh, seeing uh, cases that we believe, you know, I'm a Catholic, we believe are um, uh, attacks by uh, evil spirits. Mm -hmm. And and your book uh, here is Demonic Foes, My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist Investigating Possessions, Diabolic Attacks, and Paranormal. And uh, for, for this specific interview, I have actually ordered here, so uh, the audience who uh, is listening, I've ordered here a cross as well. And I was told to get holy water, but I uh, was not able to, to, to get that. But I'm also very, very fascinated by this because... Um, to me, you're especially talking about this as, as somebody who is uh, a psychiatrist, who has a lot of experience, who has witnessed a lot of these things. I'd like to talk a bit more about that. And I do believe that uh, there is, these are forces not to be trifled with. And you do have also evidence from it and from your own experiences. So uh, let's talk about your book. Um, what uh, led you to write this book? And what were some of the experiences you'd like to share with our audience here? Well, Arash, almost everything I've done in this field for the last 25 plus years, I've been asked, I've been requested to do. In other words, I didn't volunteer for this. Uh, and in fact, I don't, I'm not sure that it is a good idea to volunteer for this type of work. Yeah. Um, about 25 years ago, uh, you know, a priest asked my opinion. I was a little skeptical. He was happy that I was skeptical uh, because he wanted a skeptical doctor. And ever since then, I've, I've seen just a tremendous amount of cases. The book <clears throat> is published by Harper uh, Collins. I was delighted that they allowed me to write what's been described as a, a fascinating book. I have a lot of anecdotes, but it's also a serious book. I mean, it's um, it's not an academic book, but it's, it's uh, a serious treatment of this whole subject of demonic attacks, which in inherently involves, you know, some understanding of what uh, modern people call the, the paranormal. Um, so uh, they asked me to write the book. Uh, actually, there's gonna be a Hollywood movie made out of the book, okay. uh, which is uh, pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Careful what you wish for, but uh, yeah. I uh, uh, have, have, have gotten very involved in this field. The president of the American Psychiatric Association, um, a very uh, a prominent uh, American psychiatrist, he used to be my chairman. He wrote the preface to my book and he said that I've probably seen more of these cases than any physician in the world. I, I would actually say that I've probably seen more of these cases, uh, which in some people's eyes is a dubious distinction, but I've probably seen more of these cases than any uh, physician in history because now, you know, people from all over the world can contact me uh, by phone or by Zoom or whatever. So I, I've had a tremendous amount of experience in the last 25 to 30 years 
uh, evaluating these cases. Again, I'm not an exorcist or anything myself. Uh, I, I tend to But be... you're an expert on it. And uh, there's leaders of all faiths who, who come to you and who, who are uh, talking to you, ministers, priests, rabbis, imams. And what I find that fascinating with that is something that uh, affects everyone and everyone can relate to from regardless from their own faith. Because there, there seems to be that kind of like that that presence of evil in, in pretty much any faith, that major faith that 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 we have in the world. So uh, that's why they also come to you. Well, I know Arash, you're very knowledgeable about world religions and spiritualities, mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right that most major religions. There's a couple of mm -hmm. minor religions that are exceptions, like the Sikhs. Uh, but most uh, major religions have very definite views about evil spirits. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I uh, am told uh, sometimes, well, how does it feel to be out of the mainstream? I say, well, what do you mean? What mainstream are you talking about? I say most Americans believe in evil spirits, which mm -hmm. is true by surveys. Most people around the world today believe in evil spirits. And throughout history, the vast, vast majority of people I've always believed in evil spirits. Now, it is true that some people have confused, you know, mental or other medical illnesses with evil spirits. And that's why, you know, uh, people in the church often call me in. Uh, having said that, uh, the belief, however, in the kind of paranormal phenomena that you often see with uh, evil spirits is pretty ubiquitous throughout the world, uh, despite certain modern people being skeptical of that obviously that is one thing i want to get into and that's one of my discussion points too like psychosis uh, psychosis versus possession and devil uh being possessed and attacked by by a demonic force but before getting to that i'd like to know uh, what was it what was the turning point from turning from a cynic to to a believer or believing in these things was it based on the experiences you had the the things you have witnessed has that changed your perspective a bit well, I would have been, uh, cynic is a strong word. I don't think mm. I was ever a cynic. Yeah. You know, I was brought up Catholic. I heard the stories. Mm. After my training at Yale, uh, especially at Rush, that was a time where uh, we had what was called the satanic panic in America, where, <laughs> where people were claiming all kinds of Satanists were running wild. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody said that, more than 50,000 kids were kidnapped in a year by Satanists. Mm -hmm. There weren't even 50,000 missing kids, mm -hmm. and most of those kids were runaways. So it was exaggerated. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't a few scattered Satanists here and there. There are always nefarious people who worship the devil and stuff like that. But even, even, even in the modern times, in the newspapers, you read about some hysteria about this stuff which continues to this day. So I was a little skeptical. <laughs> I didn't think I would ever see a case. And um, as I said before, that's what appealed to the original priest who came to um, ask for my consultation on a case. Uh, that was not a possession. That was what we call an oppression. And I, I, I could not find any other, you know, I was a well-trained psychiatrist. I was at Cornell Medical College at the time, and I could not find any explanation that didn't involve some type of, you know, paranormal experience. Uh, as I became much more familiar with cases, including possessions, yes, very quickly, I became much more a believer, not only, in a sense, deepening my own faith, I would say, as a Christian, but also... Um, you know, believing that these phenomena, albeit rare, for instance, I still think possessions are rare, and anybody who's diagnosing possessions all the all over the place is making a mistake. But even though these experiences in any particular, you might say, county or something are fairly rare, uh, many priests will never see a case. On the other hand, uh, if you if you add them up in total and you take the cases not only around the world today, but throughout history. Uh, in fact, th there have been a, a, a very large number of these cases. So mm -hmm. 
now, now I now I am a firm believer, and I I would like to think that it actually deepened my faith in the supernatural realities of uh, my religion. <clears throat> I think so. It's really the Catholic uh, priests who are the only ones who perform exorcisms, or are there other uh, faiths and religions that look at it as well, or is it just really the the Catholics? And my second, my follow up question would be: Is there recovery? Do people recover from it? Do they free themselves from from these uh, demonic attacks? Well, the second part of your question is that people definitely can get liberated they have to work at it and 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 it's much better if they have you know spiritual supports and people praying as in an exorcism certainly exorcisms and deliverance prayers are not exclusive to christianity um obviously there are many non-catholic christians in america who get involved in deliverance ministries the the Eastern Orthodox tradition has a very venerable uh, and standardized way of dealing with these cases, just as the Catholics do. I, I tend to find that the Catholic priests are often called in on the worst cases. They have kind of, by and large, uh, the most training and the most, you might say, education and reputation for efficacy in these cases. But uh, they, there are people in other religions, too. Uh, you know, for instance, I have spoken to imams who, who do a type of exorcism. I'm not saying that only, only Christians could do uh, exorcisms. Uh, Muslims believe very much, as Christians do, that um, these are evil spirits who, can, who are fallen angels who can possess people. And, and they, they, they have the jinns and they have different, again, according to religions, they have different interpretations of them. And so what we see, though, in media, and I want to also touch a bit on that, like movies like The Exorcist and so on, it's mostly the, the focus is on, on Catholic priests. And so to, to what extent is there, for someone who has witnessed them uh, himself, um, how is this accurate and how is it deviating from what actually happens in, in that process? I'd be fascinated to know that. Well, as 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 you may know, uh, as a knowledgeable person, and as m much of your many of your audience may know, the the exorcism movie itself, the original movie, which was voted the scariest movie of all time, was very successful. It was based on a real case, so uh, these cases um, can get better. Number one. Uh, what I think Hollywood often gets wrong is they they treat it as exclusively a kind of magical ceremony, mm -hmm. as if you know you say mumbo jumbo prayers and everything is magically um, uh, delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, in the real world, the victim of the possession, I'll call them the victim. Mm -hmm. The victim has to work at it themselves. In other words, they have to often renounce something in their life that has led to the possession because these things don't come out of the blue. You know, I've, I've evaluated 25,000 cases in my life as a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes into my office and says, oh, by the way, Dr. Gallagher, all of a sudden I had a possession. You and know, I find that fascinating the, because, sorry, in the movie, it's just like innocent girl. And we, we feel like we're like at, uh, at, it depends, like we have no type of protection and it just could have befall uh, anyone. But from what I've heard is there's like certain things that would go beforehand. And we have the expression of facing your inner demons. And when uh, when I was doing that myself, there's a lot of like dark side that comes up. And so that we need to deal with, I think. And I don't think we're doing enough of it. But I like the, the kind of sense of like, yes, we do have something to protect ourselves, not just the, again, relics or, or or faith and so on, but there there is a certain way that we can we can guard off uh, evil. Would that be correct? Uh, correct perception? Oh, absolutely. I mean, someone with a healthy spiritual life mm -hmm. who doesn't get involved in nefarious activity, doesn't get involved in occultism, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, that person is going to be safe. Now, now, there are people who foolishly have invited demons in, almost like like at the end of the movie, uh, The Exorcist, where the priest 
invites the demon to attack him rather than the girl. That's that's not a very sensible thing to do. Um, the, the, the girl herself in the movie, if you remember, she played around with Ouija boards. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the reason people make an issue of that is because technically Ouija boards are summoning spirits, uh, which is a dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been condemned, for instance, in the Bible and in a lot of religions. And the original case was a boy in Maryland who had a spiritualist aunt and uh, she had taught him about channeling spirits, including using a Ouija board. And so after she died, he was trying to summon spirits. And unfortunately, um, when you try to do that, you don't know what's going to happen. You, you may be summoning evil spirits in a way that gets you into trouble. That apparently is what happened to that boy. And so uh, it's uh, it, it, even the making of it on the set. I heard there were lots of incidents that were uh, they couldn't really explain, and there were like fires and uh, uh, a lot of things happening. So uh, we we see that also. I think from my own personal experience, not just just evil, but just spirituality, we see signs everywhere. There are things that happen that make us realize that our, our lives that we think of as as normal or sane and so on, there's another layer to it. And there's like a, another dimension to it, like the, the spiritual side, where things don't make a lot of sense. I've had experiences where I just cannot explain in any logical and clear way. So I I, I think that's, that's fascinating that uh, um, there is uh, uh, people who are talking about that, validating some of these experiences. And I want to get to the question also, the difference between now psychosis and uh, uh, being possessed. Again, it's not uh, uh, the two uh, our, Thomas Schaas uh, talks interestingly about devil worship and talks about the myth of the illness and uh, the mental illness. And I wouldn't go that far, but I think there are some cases where we quickly dismiss things and think, oh, that's just uh, psychosis, when in fact it is something something else. And uh, um, I think we need to be very clear on that of like establishing some sort of like that line between sanity and insanity, and it's not as, as clear cut as we often may think it is. Well, first of all, you're right that it, during the filming of the Exorcist movie, there was a lot of weird stuff mm -hmm. that went on, mm -hmm. a lot of dark stuff, uh, mm -hmm. fire breaking out. I have spoken to people who were involved in that movie, and uh, it was not it, it, it was not a happy filming. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the larger issue you you bring up. Um, I would say you have to make some sharp distinctions. I mean, that's why they get a psychiatrist involved. Mm -hmm. There have been a, a number of conditions throughout history that have been confused for demonic attacks. Mm -hmm. That may include something like um, epilepsy uh, or uh, Tourette's disease where mm -hmm. the person blasphemes especially in the modern world where people are a little more sophisticated about diagnoses, it tends to be psychiatric conditions that get confused for demonic attack. So you may have a person who is psychotic, say they're schizophrenic or bipolar or even, even substance abuse related psychosis. And that person may well have uh, hallucinations uh, usually auditory, but sometimes with the uh, drug abusers, visual hallucinations of demons and and uh, feeling that they're hearing the voice of devils. Uh, they may also be hearing the voices of uh, uh, supposed communists or FBI or whatever. Yeah. Now, you have to recognize that uh, the church has pretty much always recognize that that is mental illness and that's why mental illness has to be ruled out there are other conditions too where someone is very suggestible um, some of the more uh, hysterical or histrionic cases say uh, that you see on tv uh, by a televangelist may well be mostly a suggestible yeah. hysterical type of case yeah. there are also people who dissociate into a trance uh, we used to call it multiple personality disorder. Now we call it dissociative identity disorder. And they may feel they have a personality, what they call an alter 
which is demonic. Uh, these are some of the most common conditions of rash, including neuro some neurological, some bizarre neurological syndromes where, where a doctor has to rule out uh, the individual suffering from a medical or a psychiatric illness. And that's that's often when I'm called in um, to try to you know make sure that we're not dealing with a, an illness. Even in the official manual of the church, which is the Roman ritual, uh, which has existed for centuries, it's not something new. Uh, the the manual very explicitly uh, cautions the exorcist number one not to jump to the conclusion of a demonic attack, and also to rule out medical illnesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that distinction, again, yeah, is very important. So you would be the person who would then decide and say, yes, I, this we would need... Well, uh, I'm, not the only, them, I'm, I'm not the only person, and I would mm -hmm. I would advise the, mm -hmm. the exorcist. These are, these are spiritual conditions. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't treat possession. Mm -hmm. I'm not an exorcist. Sure. So, yeah. you know, ultimately, the exorcist of whatever religion has to take responsibility themselves for making the spiritual decision and for and for ministering the proper spiritual help i mean that's not something i do as a as a layman and as a doctor one one of the things that also fascinated me for the longest time we talked about we talked about extraterrestrials and that is something aliens do not exist and if you if you say that they exist then uh, you are insane or you are suffering from something and now we have scientists who are talking about it and now we have like certain types of evidence so it kind of like opens up i think the field in many ways that a lot of the perceptions we used to have uh are are kind of uh, changing and uh do, do you see that that way too because i'm perplexed by that for the longest time people i thought okay uh, i don't believe in, in, in alien life and then suddenly you have respected people who are talking about that in earnest so uh, does that change our whole perspective and shift of how we define what is normal and what's uh, seen as normal? Well, first of all, I want to make it clear. I do not believe aliens visit the earth, period. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. what happens is people have certain psychic experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, some people may mistake things like a weather balloon. Other people may, may be psychotic. Mm -hmm. But other people seem to have all kinds of odd experiences that are in the realm of the psyche. Uh, for instance, some people astral project. Uh, it's, it, they take like a psychic journey. Mm -hmm. Now that phenomenon is real, but it's not like they're really going to a different place. Mm -hmm. Something is happening in their psyche. So you have to make the distinction that a lot of people don't make. You know, what is uh, genuinely paranormal which again, doesn't mean that aliens exist. I, I do not believe <laughs> aliens exist. I think people have argued very uh, cogently in my opinion that for an alien to visit the earth, they would have to go faster than the speed of light. It would take millions and even trillions of years. I mean, you know, the whole thing seems a little preposterous to me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that people don't have odd experiences. Mm -hmm. Now the question becomes how to, how to explain all these odd experiences. The modern world uses the term paranormal, and they'll use the term paranormal of ghosts. They'll use the term paranormal of sometimes of aliens. <clears throat> I'm not going to pronounce on all of them because some of them are misperceptions. But in the Catholic Church, we tend to not use the term paranormal. We use the term preternatural. Okay. In other words, the supernatural realities, which are divine realities, like a miracle or like, you know, some appearance of God, say to Moses or, uh, you know, the resurrection or something. You know, we, we believe there are supernatural marvels. On the other hand, they're, they're, the, the demons have some major ability, even, even though they're spirits, they have major ability to confuse people mm -hmm. and even, even give them visions um, do all kinds of things that they're in a possession, say, where they uh, distort the experience of the individual, as well as do things like uh, manifest 
mm -hmm. when the person is in a possessed state. Very bizarre phenomena, even levitation, even uh, speaking in foreign languages. We we in the Catholic Church and and the Christian churches generally uh, would say that some of that, maybe a lot of it, is demonic tricks and demonic behavior, and we put it in the realm of the preternatural. In other words, we we, we think a, a certain amount of paranormal phenomena, which in sometimes is simply you know people's ignorance. But in other cases, or hoaxes, for instance, in, in certain in certain cases, these odd experiences uh, are best explained as demonic tricks. But I think also the paranormal. A lot of people are are scared of it, and I I do see the the positive side as well that there are not just like again evil spirits and so on there are spirits that meaning to do goods and I, I see that's kind of like the, the the balance between the two now is it also true that if you ask them like they say in the movies that they are bound by telling you the truth they say who are you and they're supposed to tell you the truth or is that something that just uh, Hollywood added to it or uh, what, what was what has been your experience of that well, I've been to a number of exorcisms, and <laughs> it is not true that demons don't lie during the exorcism. Mm -hmm. okay. They do. Yeah, that makes sense. If yeah. the priest commands them mm -hmm. in a relevant area, in other words, you, uh, the priest is not supposed to go in and ask curious questions, you know, mm -hmm. just inquisitive questions. Demons mm -hmm. can lie in these mm -hmm. in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. But if, if eventually the exorcist is getting control of the individual, uh, then through the power of our Lord, not through the power of the exorcist, the demon is sometimes compelled, especially as a case is, is being successfully treated, to tell the truth. Now, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Many demons lie about who they are. So they will pretend to be a dead soul. Mm -hmm. or they will pretend to be even a pagan deity. I had a guy who was possessed once. He told me that uh, Zeus was manifesting himself. Oh. So throughout history, demons have often disguised themselves and lied. Now, what happens in a successful exorcism when the, when the priest, through the power of our Lord, is getting more control of the demon then the demon is forced to tell the truth. That's a good sign. And they, they, in my experience, invariably, eventually, reluctantly, hesitatingly, mm -hmm. they, they, they have to admit that they're a demon after lying about, you know, all kinds of other things. You see that in spiritualism, too. Mm -hmm. I had a woman who came to me and she said, uh, Dr. Gallagher, uh, angels are talking to me. She was a perfectly sane woman. She'd already been evaluated psychiatrically. And and then she said, I don't really believe that because I don't think angels, you know, would, would appear to me. You know, I'm just an ordinary person. Then she came back and she said, these are dead souls that are appearing to me. They've changed their tune. And I advise her to continue working with the clergy person she was working with. And eventually she said to me, again, this is a woman who was hearing, getting messages, not, not really hallucinating, but getting messages in the way that a spiritualist does. Mm -hmm. And I know many spiritualists, by the way, so I'm very familiar with the phenomenon of spiritualism. Often they think they're in contact with dead souls. Um, but this woman eventually uh, came to the conclusion, and it's been my experience with a lot of these individuals, that eventually uh, the, the spirit reveals itself. And the spirit said to her, uh, yes, we've been lying. We're, we're demons. Uh, that's a pretty interesting story if you reflect yeah. upon it, that they lied about being angels, which they can do, although they, we believe they're fallen angels. They lied about being dead people and only reluctantly, this was only because she was getting prayers said over her, only reluctantly at the end did they hesitatingly have to admit that they were evil spirits. I find that a fascinating example of, uh, 
of the kind of thing that I that I've been talking about. And also scary because then you we tend to trust in the the, the spirit and so on. So I, I think be, that we have to be careful. About, yeah. About, yeah. You know, the, the traditional term of Rush, as I'm sure you're aware, is test the spirits, discern yeah. the spirits. Yeah. And as you may know, in the in the uh, Tanakh, which is the uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are very severe warnings about summoning spirits. Mm -hmm. Now, I was fascinated to, uh, and I had uh, uh, a guest here uh, talk about um, Jung and William James and how they were connected to the paranormal, that basically Jung's mo mother might have been a psychic and he himself as well. So that connection with spirituality that started off with with, uh, with psychology and so on, and then how it distanced itself later on. Uh, and now it's, I feel like we have a chance of, of, of combining it and getting back to those roots, which I think are very important important too. Some, something I personally believe. I, I, I have a slightly different view about someone like Jung. Jung, okay. Jung essentially, and a lot of people don't know this, mm -hmm. he was essentially an, an occultist. Okay. And at the highest level, many of the Jungians are very much into, uh, to this day, into paranormal experience. Mm -hmm. But I, I do not think that was a healthy... Uh, okay. okay. I do not think that was a healthy movement mm -hmm. within... Um, uh, psychology. Now, you know, Jung came up with some interesting ideas. He had, he, mm -hmm. he, he, I believe he was the one who coined the term introvert versus extrovert. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. all Jungian ideas are complete nonsense, but mm -hmm. I, I think at its core, uh, Jungian goes off in, in lights of occultism, which okay. are poorly recognized as relatively dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think one of the things that we often talk about the problem of evil and we say so that's given as like proof that uh, God and, and the good does not exist. But I think it's also a question like why does good exist? I mean, to, to kind of turn it around, because the fact that there is a lot of goodness, there are lots of good people out there and so on, we, we tend to overlook that. So um, what do you think of that? Because that's something it's, it's waged against the existence of God, the problem of evil. But I think it's, it's much more complicated than that. And there are a lot of good things that we are overlooking when we're focusing solely on, on the, the bad aspects. Well, I definitely believe in good and evil. And the, the theological explanation involves the fact that God creates us free. <laughs> so if you're free to do good, you're free to do evil. <laughs> I mean, there's a mystery to it. You know, the, the medieval world used to call it the mysterium iniquitatis, the mystery of evil. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it is a little um, striking that some people uh, are attracted to evil in major, major ways. Mm -hmm. But as you say, uh, Arash, uh, other people are attracted to good and somebody uh, can become a Hitler and somebody can become a Mother Teresa you know, taking care of poor people. So God allows us freedom. I mean, that, that's in a way why the Christian churches actually teach that it's possible to separate yourself eternally from God because God doesn't force himself on people. So if you choose God and you try to lead a good life, most Christians would say there's a very good chance you're going to you know, meet the presence of God. But if you if you take your free will and you reject God, God doesn't force himself on people. And those people, you know, go to their own place is the traditional place. And I find existentialists really like that uh, freedom and choosing. I really like that. But they eliminated the, the God part. They eliminated that, that, that spiritual aspect of it. And it's more just like the existence here. But I think if you combine it, it's, that's really it. I mean, we, we choose. And, and that's a good thing to, to choose. But we have to be more responsible about our choices and what we choose to do and not be led astray by, by many others, whether like uh, physical people or, or spiritual entities, I think. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, without freedom, without free will, we'd be robots. And yeah. you know, God, did, God didn't want us. And what would be the point? Be... What would be the point of God existence? God created it that way. Yeah. So I agree with you yeah. that the existentialists struggled mm -hmm. and recognized that man is forced to be free mm -hmm. uh, 
although they didn't have they didn't have any overall philosophical understanding of you know why that happened in the first place why human beings were created to to be to be free to choose good or evil <laughs> Exactly. Uh, now, um, I, I'd like to hear uh, a couple of your cases that you would like to share here with the audience that are, again, those bizarre moments, those odd moments that, that you talked about. So anything you, you would like to share here to to wrap up our, our podcast, what to which story would you talk? I mean, I'm saying story, but which experience would you would you uh, like to mention here for our audience? Well, I have a million stories, and that's yeah. that's why that's why I write the, that's why I wrote the book Demonic Foes to share some of the most uh, interesting and illustrative cases. In other words, the cases I chose in the book were illustrating a a, a fact or a observation about mm -hmm. possession and and exorcisms. Probably the most dramatic mm -hmm. case that I uh, ever experienced. It was described by the exorcist as even in their view, the two exorcists working with her as the most uh, flamboyant case they had ever seen. Okay. This is a woman who had an exorcism where she spoke all kinds of foreign languages. She levitated for about a half an hour as nine or 10 people told me they observed. I wasn't at that exorcism. And, uh, you know, for times the room went dark, uh, the, room, the room became very hot. Uh, all kinds of bizarre things happened. Now, who was this woman? I call her Julia. That's not a real name, but everything in the chapter three of the book that I write about her case was literally true. Uh, she saw me not because the priests were confused about her being possessed. They knew she was possessed, but she was ambivalent about getting help. And that was because she was a Satanist. She was one of these rare Satanists, which I do not see all over the place. So she was very honest with me. She said, I worship Satan and he gives me some gifts. And uh, she had some ability, um, if you know the paranormal term, sort of similar to a more general word, clairvoyance. She could see people at a distance. And she could, she, she for instance, once described the exorcist who was 100 miles away to a T what he was doing and he wasn't doing, he was doing something very unusual for him. He was walking along a beach. She would have no way of knowing that. She also told me, for instance, how my mother died and, but she knew how a lot of people died. The way I got introduced to her is perhaps an interesting story. Uh, I was, I was with my wife in, in, in our bedroom uh, and about three o'clock in the morning, our cats went berserk. They'd never done that before. Oh, wow. And we, we, you know, we were mystified. We separated them apart and went back to sleep. The very next morning, I met her for the first time. I was introduced to her. And the first words out of her, her mouth were, Dr. Gallagher, how did you like the cats last night? She knew, she not only knew it, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to, you have to believe that she was somehow involved yeah. in that. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't think she could cause it herself, but I think evil spirits could cause it. Um, I remember sitting with her in a car once, uh, driven by the priest, and all of a sudden she goes into a trance, and uh, this this voice using her vocal cords because they 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 possess the body, they can't they can't possess the soul of the person. Um, all of a sudden, this uh, gravelly voice uh, came out of her, addressed the priest and said, uh, you know, we told, we, we told you, you effing priest, leave her alone. She's ours, you mm -hmm. monkey, you monkey priest. And I always felt that that was an illustration of how they think of human beings. It was sort of just mm -hmm. monkeys. Mm -hmm. And they, I believe in evolution. I believe in the Big Bang. I believe in science. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm, a, I'm a physician, so I mm -hmm. certainly accept uh, a lot of the, most of the findings of, of mainstream science. Mm -hmm. And these creatures have observed uh, mankind from the beginning. People say, well, why do they, how are they, why, why do they only speak uh, Latin? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not true. They, they can speak all languages. I was at an exorcism where uh, we didn't know what language the person was speaking, those of us who were observing. 
until at the end, the exorcist said she was speaking Bulgarian because I'm from Bulgaria. So he understood it, but nobody else did. So you have all these remarkable phenomena, Arash. And again, you know, you see enough of this stuff and uh, I write about it in the book. Uh, you have to, you almost have to become a believer. And, and science so, cannot always, explain that. I think that is the uh, thing. I mean, uh, these are the limits of, of science. Yeah. I always tell the story of this guy I know and, you know, he didn't know I do this work. Uh -huh. And he read my book and he and he's and he said, Rich, how come you never told me about any of this? I said, Well, I don't go around talking to everybody yeah. about it. I said, what, what do you think? He said, he said, Rich, I think if someone objectively reads this book, they they can never again believe that a scientifically trained, intelligent person hasn't made a very good case. For the existence of evil spirits, and and that's essentially a rush. Why I wrote the book. I wrote the book to educate the public. That's wonderful. So I uh, just to remind everyone again. So your book is uh, "Demonic Foes: My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist Investigating Possessions, Diabolic Attacks, and the Paranormal." Dr. Richard Gallagher, you're a psychiatrist, professor of psychiatry, author, and uh, you are uh, you are a member here of the. Um, um, uh, International Association of Exorcists since the 1990s. That's correct. So you have been around this for a long time. You're an expert. Uh, you are trustworthy, more than trustworthy. And uh, and uh, your book uh, seems like a, a wonderful book that I would I would highly recommend for people to 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 read with an open mind. And just a final question too: Do you think that's the the Faustian deal we like to have? We are looking for that to to gain some sort of benefit out of it because I'm still um, uh, I don't understand why people would would choose. Uh, uh, the dark side of things. Is that like they ex experience uh, Arash, something Arash, beneficial? Arash, it, it's, there's something a little perverse about it, but uh. the fact of the matter is these people throughout history who engage in tremendous evil, like human sacrifices, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. and these people who worship Satan, you know, mm -hmm. rare that they are, of mm -hmm. course they expect to get something out of it. That Satanist woman I said that I, that I write about uh, and they are going to make a movie about her. Uh, that Satanist woman said to me, of course, I get things out of it. She said, this God you believe in, I, I don't understand him, but I know that Satan gives me powers and and she boasted of the powers and, you know, he, Satan makes me happy. So again, these people in, in one sense are doing something very foolish. They're turning mm -hmm. to evil. But they're doing it out of their own free will, maybe a little distorted by their ignorance. But they they absolutely, you know, why did the why did the Carthaginians in in ancient times sacrifice children? Because they thought they got something out of it. And it's the same with anybody who turns to evil and even explicit occultism or Satanism. They feel they get something out of it. Thank you so much for, for sharing your, your wisdom, your insights. And I love it that it's a choice, that we do have a choice. And uh, I, I, that gives me also hope for, for things. But again, uh, sadly, a lot of people do not choose wisely. So, um, but we can we can try our best to try to convince them. And uh, again, your book, Demonic Foes, I would uh, I recommend that. Thank you so much for being on Rash as well, Dr. Richard Gallagher. You're very welcome.